Um, so your team at Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development is working on a vaccine for COVID-19. Where in the process is the vaccine and when is the earliest it may be available? So there are about probably going to be a dozen different vaccines that move into clinical testing over the next few weeks and months and and with a goal, and the reason we're doing so, testing so many different vaccines is the idea that we want to have at least two or three that could be ready for licensure in as quick a period of, of time as possible. So our group, uh, which is called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, it's, it's part of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, where I'm also a professor and dean, has had a coronavirus vaccine program for the last decade. And one of the vaccines that uh, hopefully that will go into clinical trials um, might be ours. So vaccines are usually a pretty long timeline, uh, many years often, but with, we're in this kind of Manhattan Project type situation where we we'll hope to get something out pretty quickly. And so when would be the earliest a coronavirus, a novel coronavirus vaccine would be on the market? Well, it, it's hard to say. It really depends on how the clinical testing goes. Here's the problem. You know, it, we can uh, develop a number of vaccines fairly quickly. Ours actually went through years of animal testing, others less so. But they still have to all go through that same pipeline uh, to show that the vaccine actually works in people in an area where transmission is underway and also uh, that it's safe. And, and that those timelines are tough to accelerate. So the aspirational goal is a year to 18 months. That's going to be tight. Uh, you know, the world's record, I think, is four years, four or five years. So we have to break the world's record. And it means every, all hands on deck. We're all working uh, late hours and, into, and waking up early in the morning to make it happen. And, uh, and, and we'll see uh, because we recognize that there's a big urgency. The difference is our vaccine also is going – as one that's specifically tailored for global health because it's a low cost vaccine and one that's easily affordable and accessible. So this would be a great vaccine, especially for, for parts of the Middle East that would have trouble affording it. You know, who's gonna make the vaccine for Yemen or Sudan or for you know, Iraq and, and Syria and, and places like that? And we're hoping that ours might be one of them. And so compared to other vaccines, in development, how will yours be better suited for the low and middle income countries? So ours uses a very old and established technology. It's a recombinant protein technology uh, that actually uses the exact same technology that's used for the hepatitis B vaccine that's used all over uh, the Middle East and North Africa region. So, and not only that, there's a lot of capability to manufacture it locally in, in many parts of, of the world. So potentially India, for instance, could do local manufacturing. There's only modest capacity for making vaccines in the Middle East, but maybe that would be a possibility as well. And we have a lot of good uh, collabor collaborations with scientists in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Could this be something that's made in, in Saudi or uh, in the Emirates? This is also something that we'd like to explore. Now, I'm wondering, once a vaccine is created and goes through all these trials, is there going to be priority in terms of distribution? Uh, would people who are more at risk, let's say those who are elderly or healthcare workers, would they be the first ones in line to get this vaccine? Well, there's two components to that. One is I'm a little worried about some of the vaccines being made in the U.S. and Europe and testing there whether they have such a sophisticated technology that it will, won't be easy to uh, give to areas like the Middle East and North Africa. And that's one of the, hopefully one of the advantages of ours that, that it should be fairly easy to uh, transfer that technology, you know, assuming everything goes well. Uh, the other is the fact that there may be different vaccines for different populations, maybe different vaccines for older individuals who are at risk or those with underlying chronic conditions, or maybe different vaccines for healthcare providers. I don't think it's going to be a situation where there's just one vaccine that emerges. I'm predicting there will be at least three or four uh, that that'll be out there and, and may vary depending on use and depending on needs locally. And how often if this virus keeps coming back, 
well, we have to get this vaccine every year, every three years, like, you know, once in our life, what would be the, the timeline? Well, we don't know for sure. I, I think part of the, the, the thinking is this probably won't be like influenza where, where the virus changes and we have to create a new vaccine every year. I don't think we'll be in that kind of situation. So I'm hoping that if we vaccinate and, and maybe boost that that may be all you'll need for a long time. We'll see how long the vaccine lasts and, and if the virus comes back and whether we'll need additional boosters. But I'm not envisioning it'll be an annual uh, vaccine, maybe once a booster, and then that may last us for a few years. That would be the hope. And I'm wondering, once a vaccine is available, will our world go back to normal? Or are there's groups of people who are anti-vaccination for cultural reasons, religious reasons, maybe lack of information. If these groups of people don't get vaccinated, will there still be a huge risk of another pandemic breaking out? Well, there's two parts to that, not only from the anti-vaccine movement, but sometimes it's a question of access and certain populations may not even have access to the vaccine. That's one of the things we're trying to fix with our global health vaccine. So yes, uh, if, if we don't develop adequate herd immunity globally, this will be a, a virus that can stay around for a long time. And look, look at measles. We've had that vaccine for decades. It's safe, it's highly effective but it's, it's very fragile. And so that when the use of the vaccine declines, as we've seen in the last couple of years in places like Philippines uh, or, or in Madagascar, then the virus returns. And so yes, we'll have to maintain our vigilance with vaccinating. But for now, let's focus on actually getting that vaccine out there. And you helped develop a vaccine against SARS. How similar is that vaccine to the one now for COVID-19? Well, we're de we've developed a vaccine both for SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome that emerged out of southern China in 2003, as well as the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, MERS, that came out of the Arabian Peninsula in 2012. And initially, we think the SARS one may be close enough to this new virus that causes COVID-19, which some are calling SARS-2 that we could repurpose it. And that's one of the vaccines we're rolling out now. Then we're also developing a vaccine that's quite specific for COVID-19. It's similar technology, similar approach, but there are some uh, minor differences between the two vaccines. And I'm wondering if you could explain the risk that developing countries may have in being denied access to a vaccine against the coronavirus. Well, I'm very worried what happens as this virus races through low and middle income countries, especially in the crowded urban areas where, where it's very difficult to practice social distancing. How do you do social distancing in the crowded urban areas of, uh, of Baghdad or, or you, know, you name it, uh, in, in Mumbai and in Delhi and in, Cal in Calcutta and in Dhaka? It's almost impossible. And so these populations are extremely vulnerable. So I'm worried this virus, as it tears through um, Asia Minor and, and Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, it's going to cause a devastating uh, toll on, on human health and human productivity. And I'm wondering if you can speak at all to the responses that different countries in the Middle East region have had to the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Uh, is there something that you've seen that has worked that you would recommend all other countries in the region do? Well, we've, um, I've given a, a webinar in, in Saudi Arabia. We used to do a lot, I used to do a lot in the Middle East uh, because I served as U.S. Science Envoy in the Obama administration 2015-2016. And in that role, I was tasked with helping to build vaccine development uh, across the Middle East and North Africa. And, and we helped build some infrastructure in, in Saudi Arabia with universities there. So we're hoping uh, that we can build on that because there's an urgent need to create vaccines locally. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, almost no vaccines are produced in the Middle East from start to finish. And uh, that's a huge vulnerability because there's so many diseases, COVID, we're talking about COVID-19 today, but there are a lot of diseases 
that are arising out of the collapsed healthcare infrastructures of places like Iraq and Syria and Yemen. And, and you know, if you look at a play country like Saudi Arabia, right in the middle of it all, there's an extreme vulnerability there. Or uh, in the United Arab Emirates, there's extreme vulnerability. And I think there's a great need to build indigenous local capacity for vaccine development, but it, it does require work and it requires a long-term outlook. It, it requires a decade long uh, time horizon and, and there are not many uh, leaders with the vision who are willing to do that. And now I know there is uh, at least one coronavirus vaccine being uh, developed in Saudi Arabia, but I believe that it will have to, uh, you know, in the further steps have to outsource to other countries. Um, would the U.S. be willing to work, um, you know, with Middle Eastern countries on that? Well, I can't speak for the whole United States. I, uh, all I'll do, I'll speak for our group, and we've been working hard to promote technology transfer in the Middle East and places like Saudi. And, and um, if there's interest in working with us, we'd be more than happy and build on my time as U.S. Science Envoy. I think there's great opportunities to work in the Middle East. Look, it's such a vital region for the world, and uh, we can't uh, allow its population to live in that kind of vulnerability because if there's insecurity in the Middle East, uh, then, then it translates to insecurity globally. Well, Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for joining us today. You provided a lot of answers to many questions. Well, thank you. It's a real honor to talk to you today.